Yes. I am going to get started. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, Fiona will be welcoming people in that um, come in a little bit later, but this, this group happens to be pretty timely. So um, I will get it started. Welcome everybody to the CO Executives in Transition. Um, as everybody knows that we are a group that has started back in September that supports CO executives and, and other leaders who are in transition. And um, it's completely free. Join us anytime that you wish. And um, we also record everything that we've ever done on the Tuesday meetings and post them into our Mighty Network. If for any reason you're not in the Mighty Network, um, Fiona's the go-to and she'll make sure that you get up on there. And... Um, so speaking to people who've landed, I know Marie has, and some maybe some of the others of you have as well, as you move into your next position, you land that role, um, reach out to us and let us know. We've been hearing from people lately. Every week we're hearing from new people who have landed another, a new position. And one of the big successes this week, and many of you may know George Murray, um, he's been in and out of this, this, um, these sessions and also wrote a book called Hired, How to Cut Your Career, time, career Search Time in Half. Uh, just was out of a job for less than a month and back into another new role. So congratulations to George. And if any of you know him, reach out to him. Um, and also, if you land back into the operations role, make sure you reach out to us because Bill and I would love to have you at one of our CO Forum um, global meetings as our guest to just experience that. Um, I think you all know our meeting, Curtis, that we tend to want to mute when we're talking, when, or at least when Steve's talking. But if he opens it up to anybody for Q&A, feel free to just come off so we can we can... I'll share. And then business first. So if you have to leave for anything, whether it's kids or a call or anything, don't worry about it. We do record this so you can always go back. Um, business language, no politics. Keep all your job prospects confidential. And uh, if you have any questions as Steve's moving along, just um, post them in the chat and I'll help monitor that for him to bring them up at the right time. Fiona is the go-to for everything with this initiative. So reach out to her if you need anything. And if, like I said, if you're not in the Mighty Network, um, it's a great resource. Make sure you reach out to her and she'll get you set up there. With that, I would like to welcome our special guest, Steve Moss, who comes to us this time. Last time I think we talked, he was still in Twin Cities, but now he's in Maryland, greater DC area. Um, I'm gonna give you a little background to him and then he can finish introducing himself. Um, Steve, Steve Moss's career has focused on building brands and developing leaders. He served as Chief Marketing Officer at Gilby Canada. Pillsbury International, Nestle Ice Cream, and Emation. He left, he's left his mark on global brands such as Smirnoff, Pillsbury, Haagen-Dazs, and Memorex. His success in building brands is matched by his passion for developing leaders. Over 50 of his reports became VPs and presidents. He founded Executive Springboard, a business using 90 mentors in 20 functions in 12 countries to help executives excel in new roles. He has a bachelor's degree from Georgetown University and an MBA from the Wharton Graduate School of the University of Pennsylvania. And with that, I'm going to let Steve take it over and walk us through um, his presentation. Well, thank you, Laura. Uh, great to be with everybody today. Um, my, my thanks to Laura and Bill and, and Fiona um, for um, including me in, in this program. I'm kind of humbled to be included um, given the lineup of speakers that you've had over the, the past few sessions. And um, I, I, I think perhaps my topic is going to be um, a little bit different than some of the others that you've, you've had. So we'll see how this works. And if I've done my magic right, everybody can see my presentation. Are we good? Yeah, okay, all right. Um, well, this, this is um, intended very much to be a conversation. So um, I welcome your comments at any time. Um, if this is breaking protocol, so be it. Um, you can, if you want to use chat, that's great. And I will try to remember occasionally to stop and ask Fiona to read me what, what may have be appearing in the chat. Um, if you just want to unmute and um, interrupt me, feel free to do that as well. So as, as Laura mentioned, my business, Executive Springboard, kind of combines mentoring with onboarding to help leaders excel in new roles. Um, and, and I think that's probably um, a, appropriate for the crowd we have here. How many of you are currently in transition? One hand up. I'm seeing a couple. Okay. 
And if you're not in transition, um, Marie, you've recently landed, right? Yes. Right. Any, anybody else who's recently landed? Okay. Well, what I see when people are in transition, there's an urgency that sometimes isn't really matched by um, the people who are hiring, but so be it. And there's a focus on getting the offer. What I want to try to do um, in, in our hour together is have you look around the corner. Um, think about the things that you will face once you land. Because the last thing that anybody in transition wants is to be back in transition a year from now because the next gig doesn't, turn, uh, doesn't go so well. I've spent the past few years studying the risks and the reasons why executives fail in new roles. I want to share some of that with you and offer up a top 10 keys for success. Okay. And with that, let's do a little bit of audience participation. What do you think are the chances? I'll take it out of making this personal. What do you think are the chances that a senior executive hire fails within the first 18 months? Is it 10%? Is it 25%? Is it 50%? Is it Higher than that, what do you think? Any thoughts? 50%. 50%? Anybody else agree? Different numbers? Third. Got a bunch of numbers coming up in the chat, Steve. Okay, okay. Yeah, well, um, we're kind of getting in that ballpark. So here's a, here's a quote. Um, from, Kev, from Kevin Kelly, who used to be the CEO of Hydric and Struggles, as they took a look at um, about 20,000 searches that they conducted, they came up with 40% of executives were either pushed out, quit, or were in some kind of zombie state um, within an 18 month period. And um, that data, those results, are confirmed by a lot of other studies. Gartner did one that put the number at 46%. Mm -hmm. Harvard Business Review said between 40 and 60%. Corporate uh, Leadership Council had it said roughly 50%. So it basically is a coin flip on people lasting more than 18 months in the new job they just landed. And that seems like a pain point to me for both corporations and for the executives. So what are some of the causes um, that would lead an executive to pack up and go or would cause an organization to invite them out the door? And just throw these out. I, um, I, I'd rather hear them than, than have you put them in chat if we could. Inability Culture. to execute. Culture, inability to execute. Changes. Misaligned. Misaligned expectations. Expectations not aligned. There was another one. Just... Staffing and resources weren't as uh, outlined or promised. Okay. Which gets back into expectations to some yep. degree. Yep. Others? Good list to start with. All right. Let's, um, let me put it this way. Um, I'll, I'll hedge my answer and say that it depends on who you ask right? You get a slightly different answer if you're talking to the executive rather than if you're talking to the company. So if you're talking to the executive, executives will say, well, there were circumstances that I, situations I faced at the company um, that were um, maybe not expected and led me to make decisions. And perhaps those decisions didn't go as well as they could. That's kind of the the side from the executives. The companies almost always blame the executives. And I suppose it's if 50% of the executives fail, well, okay, 50% um, make it. So in a kind of Darwinian sense, you know, it must be the executive's fault, right? I, I, I don't know about that, but um, it, it seems kind of short-sighted and as if many corporations don't do what they could to help executives succeed. But one thing that's really kind of interesting um, that is common on what both the executives say and what companies say is it is seldom about 
the experience somebody has coming in or their level of functional expertise. Okay, that neither one of those are reasons um, often for people to fail in new jobs. It's the people issues that bite folks in the tail. So let's dig in a little bit um, and think about both on the executive side and on the corporate side, what are some of those key functions? You mentioned some of those. Let's start with the executive's perspective from the outside in. Okay, so forgive me for comparing business to a gorilla cage. Sometimes it's a little hostile if you slip into it, and that's kind of the point I want to make. So let's think now about what um, executives would say are some of the key reasons why they, um, why they failed in their spot. And you've mentioned some of these right up front. Confusion about the role, um, that there are expectations that have been set up that um, that's not what, what people see when they come in. We'll talk more about that over the, the course of this chat. Um, partnerships, establishing partnerships or the difficulty establishing partnerships. If you think about it, at a senior level, almost nobody is said, hey, we want you to come in and do exactly what your predecessor did. We all have change agendas. And yet when we're new in an organization, we don't know how anything works. So our success is all dependent on other people. And that's kind of what management is, is achieving objectives through other folks. So your ability to create those relationships that get that help you get the work done are kind of critical. And lots of times that doesn't happen um, very easily. Executives also point out to um, limited political support. When you join an organization, you are the least politically savvy person there. And so um, it's kind of incumbent on your boss to provide a little bit of air cover for you until you get your footing. And lots of times that doesn't happen. So that can be a reason. Ineffective people management. Um, this is about trying to establish those relationships with teams. You need your team to buy into your vision. Um, there is a specific um, area here that I, I think is worth mentioning. In many instances, when you come from the outside, there's somebody else in the organization who thought they should get the job that you've gotten. And I think of them as, I call them passed over and pissed off. And they can be one of your, your early crises is how do you manage those folks, right? Um, they think they were gonna get the job. They may be acting with resentment. The question is, can you figure out a way for them to find something that they feel like they own and not become a distraction um, and a disruption to the things you're trying to accomplish through the larger team. So that's a kind of an important piece. Poor cultural fit has been mentioned. Um, it, it takes a while to learn the language of how things get done and to understand the risks of breaking the norms that are in the company. So that, that would be something. As well as, last thing I'll mention here from the executive's standpoint is lack of feedback or coaching. Sometimes there, it just feels like nobody is telling them, hey, um, there's another way of doing this. Hey, have you tried this? Um, and maybe that's you know, that, that perception from the company that if things fail, it's the executive's fault. They expect you to hit the ground running. But I think there's an awful lot to be gained from requesting feedback and listening carefully to that when it comes. Any questions, any, any thoughts, any additional comments to, to bring up? I would just say, you know, because I've been in my new role for about four months, I think sometimes the, the current management doesn't understand their own limitations. And so you have to figure out how to navigate. And that's part of the culture piece and whether you're going to fit in with the politics is how do you navigate when your, your boss is also externally good friends with the guy in procurement? So they're going to have conversations offline or things like that that you may not have experienced in the past. Yeah, it, it, and it, I think a lot of it also depends on the kind of the size of the business you're in. 
um, small businesses often have people in leadership roles who are there because of the relationship they have with an owner. Um, and that's different from mid-size or larger organizations where you can make an assumption that everybody has the skill set already. You know, that, that figure of all of, you know, as I said, I'm about ready to show, competence really isn't so, something in larger organizations that is, you know, is questioned. Um, but yeah, that's, I think that's a, a really good point. And, um, and trying, to, trying to understand that culture is, and the language that's being spoken is one of the biggest challenges that people have. Yeah. Just, just to emphasize one of the points you made, I, I think once you get to a certain point, or maybe once you have the offer and you're starting the job, asking if there's anybody else internally that had applied and thought they should get that job, I would never have thought to do it if you didn't mention it. And it's, it totally makes sense. Yeah, yeah. And, and lots of times it's, it's not even a reasonable thought that that person would have gotten the job, but hope springs eternal. And, and so there's, you know, there's that to try to, to work through. Okay, let's take this from the, from the company's perspective, from the inside of the cage out. OK, um, there was a uh, why do companies believe that executives fail? Leadership IQ um, did a survey and they asked hiring managers to report what was the single most important reason why their executives failed. And here's the list. It, among these five things, we're coming up with over 90 percent of, of the reasons. Um, the first one is being coachable, accepting feedback when it's offered. And, and changing your, um, your behavior accordingly. The second is emotional intelligence, 23%. Understanding your own emotions and the emotions of others and um, having that reflected in how it is that you, um, you communicate, how it is that you act. The third is 17% is motivation. And by that, they, they're talking about the drive to succeed and excel and the commitment that you show to an organization. So lots of times there are things that happen where um, we're giving cues unexpected, uh, um, unintentionally about, um, about our level of commitment. We'll, we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, temperament really here is... is um, the company will talk about personal personality issues that people have that get in the way of success. My way of thinking about this is this is the other side of the coin from what we're thinking about is the cultural fit. So for that executive, you know, they're looking at that reason circumstantially being something in the company for the, um, for the company, they're seeing it. No, it's nothing wrong with our culture. This is, there's something wrong with this, this uh, employee. And finally here at only 11% competence, all right? And, and this really being kind of somebody's functional um, expertise. So the message here is you get hired for IQ, you get fired for EQ. Um, and that's kind of a, I think an important distinction to make in, in how, this, how this goes. Questions, challenges, we're good? Okay, all right. Um, I want to turn it, turn this from okay. If if these are the the issues that come up, what can we do to address them? And um, there there tend to be these immutable laws. Something that a colleague of mine once called tablets of stone. And we can think of them as keys to success. But since all of these begin with a C, I'm going to call them the C's to success. And we'll take, we'll just knock off each one of these things and have a conversation as, as we go along. So let's start with coachability. And this was something, if you remember, it was right at the top of the list of what, um, what companies were saying is the reason why people um, don't succeed. And, and not hearing, not getting coaching was a reason that, that employees were reporting this as well. So you all know the maxim, don't give advice because the wise don't, he don't need it and the foolish don't heed it. Couldn't be more wrong. The wise need it. And the more senior you are in the organization, for some reason, sometimes we start viewing 
the asking for feedback or getting some coaching as a weakness. And um, that's a big mistake that, that people make. So um, we're always in learning mode. And particularly in the early days in, in, in the business, you're on the learning curve. It's really important to be asking questions and getting feedback where you can. Recognizing um, advice when it's offered is something that, that um, maybe it's because I come from Minnesota and we have this thing that's called Minnesota nice, um, that it, it comes into play. Minnesota nice doesn't mean that people are nicer in Minnesota than other places. It's just a nice way of talking about being passive aggressive, of not being able to come out and really say what's on your mind. And so people are getting hints of um, where there's a problem and they have to kind of work that through rather than somebody being really direct with them and saying, hey, have you considered this? So here's a story that happened to me. I was the chief marketing officer for Amation, publicly traded company. One of the board members um, was walking with me on a street in Manhattan after a board meeting. And he's telling me stories about his own company um, and, um, and some things that he did and, and what worked. And, and, and kind of at the end of telling me the story, he goes, you know, maybe this has some bearing on, on what you're facing in Amation. And I, I nodded, you know, just seemed like part of the conversation. Um, gave it some thought that evening, kind of dismissed it. The next board meeting, I was asked, what did you do about this suggestion? And the answer was, hum, 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 hum. I hadn't done anything, which um, didn't go over very well with the board or, and the CEO was kind of quick to tell me about that after the meeting. So being coachable isn't always about, uh, or not being coachable isn't always about digging in your heels and resisting. It may be just not hearing when the message is, is given. So um, kind of an important thing to be thinking about. At the same time, that's when somebody is offering advice when it's not necessarily clear. At the same time, you have to go out and seek advice sometimes. And where you get that advice is something to give some thought to. Who has visibility? to the things that, that involve you and will have the comfort of telling you something. Is it a peer? Is it your boss? In many instances, it might be wise to give your admin that permission because they may have the pulse of an organization and that might be really helpful for you to understand how people are viewing when it's not really clear to, clear to you. Acting on advice. All right, you're judged on the adjustments you make to the advice that you're given. So when I got spanked um, for not doing anything from the advice that I received from a board director, that was a painful learning experience for me. And it's as, as much as anything, that's really kind of important to do is to recognize what it is, reflect the, the advice you're getting, reflect on it and take some action. And to tie that action with this last point, following up with the coach, okay? If somebody, if that board director, had I recognized that he was giving me advice, I would have gone back to him before the next board meeting and said, Glenn, I thought about what you said. Um, here's why um, I don't think it's going to work here. But at least he knows that he was heard. Because when somebody is giving you advice, they're making an investment in you. Show them the return on the investment. Either you did something and they should know that you did something based on the, the input, the perspective that they provided. Or if you didn't do it, at least show that you gave it, you gave it consideration. Clear questions, challenges, comments? We're all right. Makes a lot of sense. Okay, thanks, Kevin. Um, let's talk to, about cultural fit. Does anybody recognize HWDTH as kind of a definition of culture? How we do things here. There's a set of rules. Sometimes they're written, sometimes they're spoken. Sometimes they're just absorbed about the beliefs, the values, the normative behavior of what it is that you're, you're running into. 
And it may be really different from stuff that you've seen in the past. So, you know, kind of thinking about that becomes really important. Um, Marie, I'm, I'm wondering if there were surprises that you saw in the culture when you joined. So it's interesting that you asked that question. Um, we were doing a talent review and there was a, a very awkward situation where I had to call out one of my peers for use, continuing to use terms about age in describing his concern about his current talent pool. And I had to point out that that's considered ageism um, because this is a company that was consumed a bunch of small companies. So a lot of the people are just not as overly polished. Like I came from a big corporation previously where you, it was drummed into you. So yes. Yeah. And so there's, there's, it's not even just that insensitivity to ageism. It's just an informality of how some people are working that becomes important. So, and, and a lot of these things, it's kind of critical if you can to get a handle on it before you, you, you start. I mean, cause sometimes it might, it might have a big bearing on whether you even take the job or not. So let me throw out a couple of areas that you can have conversations with people to get a handle on culture. Cause culture is a hard thing to talk about. It, it's really squishy and there's, and the language isn't all necessarily all that clear. But if you ask questions like this, where does the power lie in this organization? Um, how do people like to communicate? Because if you think about it, we often communicate in ways that are, that are easiest for us, not necessarily what's most effective to be received. And at the end of the day, that's probably more important. What um, behaviors are valued? There might be a plaque of values on a wall somewhere and that might look really different from the kinds of things that lead somebody to get promoted or end up in the penalty box. How's decision making? Is it consensual? Is it is it um, is it consensus based? Is it something that's top down? How does that all that work? Do people collaborate, or is it a siloed approach that you run into? How does the organization handle bad news? Is the first question who is responsible, or is the first question? Um, what happened and what can we do to fix it? And what does the immune system look like in this company? You're bringing change. And it's kind of important to understand whether the opposition to the change you're trying to bring is going to be overt or whether you have to kind of figure it out. So all of those are kinds of questions that might be important even in the, in the, um, in the interviewing process to try to get a handle on to see whether the culture is something that, um, that works for you, or perhaps more importantly, how you can adjust to it, right? And that adjustment period, um, you know, we, we're all in it for the first six or eight months in organizations. Um, it, it takes a little bit of perseverance. Um, it, it, it takes being willing to show your ignorance um, and to speak up about it, maybe with a little bit of humor and to ask forgiveness because you're going to make mistakes that um, will get people to look at you sideways sometimes um, as, as you kind of learn the rules of the road in, the, in, in that organization. Okay. I want to talk about competence. And as we've said, competence may be a little less important than, um, than we think. And a lot of us are wired in a way that there's nothing worse that somebody can say to us than you don't know what you're talking about. And at the end of the day, through the process of interviewing and being vetted for a job, the organization and the people that you're going to be working with know that you're a capable person and, uh, um, and, and that you're competent to do the job. That's less, you know, that is truly not all that important. Um, I'd also say that if you're heading a function, and this group is, is I know, is, is much more made up of people at COO levels, but functional leaders don't have to be the best in their function. They have to lead talented people in their function. So a lot of the job for people who are functional leaders may be to be hiring people who are even more qualified for that than they are and to win on their leadership. If you're spending time trying to prove that you're competent, you run the risk of really coming off as arrogant. 
And that may be something that, that leads to problems with fit. So instead of being in prove it mode, think about the questions that you can be asking. Instead of answering everything, just again, think about, think about what you can ask other people to learn, to evaluate the talent that you have, et cetera. No new leader is fully competent. If you go outside of the functional area and think about competence as the ability to do something effectively and efficiently, you're not doing that when you're new in a job. So what becomes kind of important in this is, um, is recognizing that, recognizing that there is a learning curve that you have to get up to and using the resources in your organization, getting the alignment for, for those who are competent, who know how to get things done in that company to start activating the things that, that are important to you. The last thing I would say here on, on competence, it's more, of, um, it's more of, and this will tie into credibility, which is another one of our C's. Comp incompetence is manifested when you don't deliver what you promise. In early days, it's probably a really good thing not to overpromise, not to be too aggressive on what it is that you're you're trying to accomplish, um, but to over but to over deliver, um, either acting with something where you can get things done sooner than you said or at a at a greater magnitude than what it was that that you've committed to. Communication. Okay, I'm a I'm a marketing guy by background, so this is this is an area that that um, I've spent a lot of time on thinking about um, in communication. The first thing that I'd say is we leaders are going to tend to want to make their vision known, and there's nothing wrong with that. But remember, communication is really two way, two two ears, one mouth. Listening is a really important skill for us to be developing, particularly in the early stages um, of our time in the job. Um, and, and what I would, so I, I would really urge you early on to really go on a listening tour and ask questions of people and explore how things get done, what's important, what are the key issues that people have. And while you're doing that, particularly when it's with people on your team, use their answers as, as a way that you start making the assessment of, of who's got what it takes longer term. If, if you've ever been close to the medical um, industry, medical technology or pharmaceuticals or whatever, in marketing parlance, they, um, they often talk about KOLs, key opin opinion leaders. And that's the who here. So it's really important. You got to recognize that there are often people in your organization that when you start talking and you start sh sharing what you want to get done, somebody might cross their arms and roll their eyes and half of the audience closes up. And knowing who those people are is important because they deserve some pre-selling. They deserve to understand where you're trying to go and for you to, to think through what the what's in it for me as it relates to them. There is a what, there is a message that we all need, particularly early on. We can think of that as an elevator speech. Um, later on, I think it gets, it gets a little bit um, more involved than just that. But people wanna know who you are, why you're excited to be there and what's your, what's your vision for the organization. And to say it in a way that shows humility that respects that there's a lot of good things that have been happening and that you hope to be able to make a, a contribution on top of this. You as, as an individual aren't going to change everything. And if you are, you don't have to tell everybody that that's what you're gonna do. Um, the when on this is really, you know, my point here is again, early on, pick your spots carefully. Um, it's, this is really the early step is where you want to be much more, do much more listening than, than speaking. And finally, the how. This is the media selection that is based on what I said about in, in, um, in a cultural question. How is it that you communicate? Um, I'm mentoring somebody right now 
um, who works at Facebook. And um, chat is a huge way that they communicate there. I'm, I tend to be an email person. And email there is only used really when you've got long involved messages to try to get across. But they also use meetings when they want to make decisions. And for a new executive to understand when it is you call a meeting and when it is you go on chat or when it is that in the before times you just walked into somebody's office and had a face to face. That all kind of takes a little bit of time to understand and do it all from the perspective of what is it that people in that organization grab onto to absorb. It's not so much about what's easy for you to do. It's what's um, what gets the most done, what's the most effective way to get that um, communication within that organization. I'm taking a pause. I've been um, rattling on for a while. And if there are any, um, if I've sparked any questions, I'd love to hear them. Anyone, anyone, Euler, anyone? I think it's all very logical so far. Okay, okay. Well, yeah, I was um, going to say, can I have this as a playbook for my next landing? <laughs> we'll talk about that. <laughs> uh, let's talk, several of you mentioned up front, um, consistent expectations or the lack of them being an issue um, in, in um, whether somebody makes it or not in the job. There is often confusion over expectations. Um, and confusion may be even a kind way of saying it. Let's look at it this way. When you're being recruited, you're selling yourself, they're selling the business. Everybody's putting as good a polish as they can on what there is. So there, there might be some things that don't get covered all that well that become really important along the way. And you know, being able to, to get at that is something that is really important. And I think perhaps the one that comes up, particularly at like a COO level or somebody else in the C-suite is the notion of autonomy. You're being told that you've got, you know, you've got ownership over X, Y, or Z. And then you start the job and, um, and the boss is paying close attention to what you can deliver and what you can't deliver. And it feels like they're right on your shoulder. It may feel like they're micromanaging and maybe they are. And that's something that, that takes a little bit of time and takes some discussions to get used to on how is it that, um, you know, this isn't what I, what I thought I was signing up for. I don't, I would mention in this to ask the hard questions that may get you to some of the, some of the things in these, these expectations early on. When I was, um, when I was interviewing at Emation, um, Emation was a, um, was past tense. Business really doesn't exist anymore, but it, they were in the digital storage media um, business. So they, they were a spinoff of 3M with computer tape and then they bought various brands of, of optical recordable CDs and DVDs and flash drives and what have you. Um, and computer tape was the big profit generator. And I, I remember asking the head of R&D, well, what's going to happen when computer tape goes away? And his response was, it's never going to go away. It will always be the least expensive option um, per um, per unit of storage. And he may be right, but at some point, everything got so low that cost became less of an impact. What became more of an impact was, can you access it? So computer tape is still used, but it's used for archiving, not for, not for backup. And um, that was the follow-up question I didn't ask. I had asked the right question, which was kind of critical on the future of this business. My follow-up question wasn't there when it should be. Um, it helps for you to come into a job, even in the interviewing process, I would say by that final round of interviews with a 90-day plan to share with, um, with those people who are making a decision on you. Because it shows that you can put yourself 
in the role. It shows that you can get granular in the role. Um, and it shows what your expectations are. And it will always be wrong. That's okay. They see how you think through that process. And so once you come into the job, what becomes really important is to take a look at that 90-day plan and figure out how much you have to trash and how much of it can, can uh, be maintained, what needs to be adjusted in it. Um, that notion I mentioned up front here on um, the, the sense of autonomy that, um, that you might, that needs to get established with your boss, it's probably also something that needs to get established with your, your reports. And somebody gave me what I thought was a terrific tool that they called Do Tell Ask. The idea is, uh, and this, this was somebody who was the president of a small business owned by two brothers who lived in Florida when he lived in Minnesota. So they were absent. He's trying to figure out how is it that I, I manage this business with people who I'm not going to be in touch with necessarily on a day-to-day -day basis. And he said, I want to know there are some things that I can just do and you never have to know about it. There are some things that I'm going to do, but I'm going to tell you about it afterwards. And then there are some things that I have to ask your permission on. Let's see what goes in each of those buckets. All right. You can never get so granular as to have everything in each of those buckets, but it creates a language that can be really important because if you do something that upsets that person on top, it might be a great way to diffuse the situation and be able to say, you know what? I guess that was an ask. I thought it was a tell, right? And just through using the language that you've already agreed on and said things at this budget level are things I can just do, things at this budget level are things I have to ask, whatever it might be, things that, that are impacting the employee base in a certain way or would, um, could have um, press consequences, we should talk through, whatever that might be, get those straight. But using the do tell ask is something that establishes a language that becomes really helpful. Moving along, confidence. So um, this is about believing that somebody will act competently. We've already talked about competence. So here's confidence, sounds similar, kind of on the same track. But it is different because this is really about the belief that somebody can do something in a competent way. And there's lots of different ways that, that are important for you to show confidence. You can need, need to show confidence in yourself. This isn't arrogance. This is your ability to get something done. Um, and um, this is um, showing that you can deliver on commitments. Um, you don't want to be so transparent with your own anxieties, okay? I'm not saying that people shouldn't be authentic in their jobs. Leadership is all about authentic self-expression that adds value. Um, but there are, there are some boundaries that you want to set up, and um, people should see that you're confident in your own ability to get things done. You need to have confidence in your team, right? Um, there may be a bit of trust but verify that's going on. But lots of times people should have the freedom to succeed. And particularly when you are new, they've been operating in a certain way without you. And yes, you want to have your imprint and that's only fair. Um, but your team has to, has to feel like you are, you have confidence in them and you have their back. Confidence in your colleagues. This is where the notion, to me, the notion of assuming positive intent comes in. And I think that's a, a critical component for people to succeed. You may get burned from time to time feeling that way and, and working from a, from a standpoint of trust up front. If you don't have this, if you come in really um, not having confidence in your colleagues, it's really, really hard to establish the relationships here that are gonna be critical in your success. And finally, overall in the organization, being able to talk about, um, about the confidence that you have to the organization, the people there, again, this may be part of the elevator speech, it may be building this into something larger like a manifesto, 
you joined for a reason. Let people see your excitement. Let them see that you believe in the mission and the, uh, and the ability of the organization to accomplish what you're trying to do. Credibility. Um, you need to be believable. Um, credibility is something that others bestow on us. We earn it. But this is where having that emotional intelligence comes through because it's really kind of important to see it um, in, the, in this process. Um, one of the things that I, I think is important here is being able to share relevant experience that you have that maybe people in the organization don't have. And this can build your credibility. You're coming in for a reason. People chose you for a reason. When I, when I joined um, Emation about, a year or so before then, the, the company had, was all of about eight years old when I joined. For the first eight years, they had one brand. They had the Amation brand. And then they bought Memorex. And then shortly after I joined, they bought TDK. So they had a portfolio of, of brands in like the recordable CD and DVD space. The products were the same. The, the brands that we came up were, were slightly different. We created different price points, et cetera. The sales force had no experience managing a portfolio before. And a lot of them were really concerned about that. And, in my, and, and people knew that I had come from a background in consumer goods where, where I managed portfolios. I had different ice cream brands that were responsible for, uh, that I was responsible, different liquor brands that I was responsible. I worked in all sorts of fun categories before, um, before um, the data management. And I remember I was at a, um, a global um, sales meeting and I said, um, trying to explain all of this, how many people have kids? And about 55% raise, about 75% raise their hand. How many of you have more than one kid and still about 60% raise your hand? Okay. If you have more than one kid, you know how to manage a portfolio, right? They're all different. Um, you love them all the same, but you treat them differently. We get to that. And so that was kind of something that was important there. The early messaging is important. It's important not to under, uh, to under promise to get the quick wins. Um, quick wins don't necessarily have to be strategic, but people have to see that you're able to get things done and particularly to get things done in a way that help your colleagues, those other people that you need to collaborate with. Commitment. Um, people want to see, you know, this is one of, those, one of those areas about how motivated folks are. People want to see a commitment. And here's where we use language in ways, we, we do things that, that sometimes we make mistakes on unintentionally. If you're still using we to talk about your old company three months into your job, you're showing a lack of commitment. We is the company that's paying you, not we being the company that used to pay you. People pick up on that. In the before times, if if um, you took a job and six months later, you hadn't moved your family because um, you, know, you wanted to see the school year out, folks are starting to shake their heads. You know, making the, your motivation known is important and getting pe people excited about um, what you're doing in a form of a manifesto, something like that is really critical. And I'd also say join the community, particularly if you're doing long distance commuting. If you're by yourself, your family is in another city, what are you doing with your time besides maybe joining the Chamber of Commerce or you know, picking up a hammer and working for Habitat uh, for Humanity if that's what your, what your business is in, um, you know, one of the things that your business um, identifies with. It's kind of important to do that so people see that you are one of us. Collaboration. You want to build alliances across, up, and down. You're not an, an individual contributor. You're counting on other people to get the work done. And so it's kind of important to be able to get those folks to help out. 
address the what's in it for me from the people and um, who you're who you're trying to help with and show your value. Your credibility can become something that's personal, right? It's how you're delivering things, not just for the organization, but for your peer who has an issue that you can help with. That's how you said, if you get in a situation like that, it becomes really easy to be asking them to reciprocate. And so early on, be thinking about not just how, how, how people can help you, but how you can help other people. And I want to end the, 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 uh, the, the tenth C is confidence. Um, and if we think about this, nobody, none of us has all the answers. Everybody has some self-doubt, and it, particularly when you're in a new role. Um, we're all works in progress. We're always learning all the way through. We learn from our experience. Some of it's painful. I've been trying to share some of my painful experiences with you. Sometimes we're learning from others, observing them, asking, listening. Those others don't just teach us. They support us. They're there for us to confide in. That's kind of the nature of, of confidants. In 2019, Vistage did a study, and 46% of CEOs um, said that internal mentors were critical to retention. And, and it didn't make any difference if it was a formal program or an informal program. They kind of felt the same way. It was really important to, to retention. When you get to a certain level in an organization, there are no internal mentors for you anymore. You won't make yourself vulnerable with somebody who might end up being the problem um, or your boss or a board member who maybe you don't want to have full transparency with what have you. And this is where other places come into play. So it may be peer circles, peer networks, like the COO forums, local meetings or Vistage or something else. Um, it might be bringing in an executive coach. It might be that you recognize as part of a portfolio of confidants that you want, that um, you really could benefit from a mentor, the kinds of people that Executive Springboard offers who've been there and done that before and can, um, and can offer help along the way. And let me just leave you with this last thought as, as we go into, into Q&A. Um, first off, for all of those of you who have not landed, I hope that, that, is, that you've learned something from George Murray and can pull that off in, in short order. When you are negotiating your offer, build in this notion of, of confidence. Think about whether it's you know, the COO network the forum, whether it's a qualified, a certified coach, whether it's executive springboard, whatever it is, see if your company is willing to make that investment in your success. Because that investment in your success is gonna be an investment in their own as well. Okay, so now I'm gonna take a deep breath and um, ask if there are any final questions that you have. Hey, I had a question. Hi, so, Tara. Hi, thank you. This is all very helpful and uh, I really appreciate all the information. With regard to the confidence, if you find yourself in a place, you get started and you either don't have confidence in the company long-term or in the leaders, the rest of the leadership long-term, What's the right amount of time to stick it out, so to say? Um, I'm not sure there's, I, I don't know that there's any um, straight answer that I can give. And it's funny, um, I, I'll, I'll just say as anecdotally, um, in the work that I do, um, we're almost always hired by the company so when somebody says to us, this is a clown show, I'm getting out of here, we don't support that. We're there trying to say, okay, listen, my job is to try to make this work. Um, not, not to give you um, career advice on when to leave. So let me park that because 
I'm not hired to, at, at this point to, to do any work here. Um, there's, I don't believe we're in a time when it's very harmful for, for you to make a decision in quick order. If you're miserable, if you take a look and say, long-term, this is not gonna work, then it's probably, it probably makes um, you know, sense for your own well-being to bail and do something. And people make mistakes and almost everybody has something on their resume that, that is um, you know, a short order thing um, and, you know, so I'm not sure, I, I, I guess I'd throw this to other people if they have, if they have um, some number in my, I think when people talk about the first 90 days, and I'm a big proponent in, in what Michael Watkins does there, um, I think 90 days is when companies are making an assessment on, on their executives, but I think that's kind of the time frame. That doesn't mean they're out after that, but I, lots of times I think their mind is made up by them. So maybe that's not unrealistic for, for you to have kind of the same thing on when it is your mind's made up. Okay, thank you. I know there's mm -hmm. no like one right answer. There's no formula, but I was just curious if other people had any uh, opinion on it. Yes, yeah, does anybody else have a point of view on that? I, I think I would say it depends on if you could stick it out for a year or two and actually get some good experience that would be helpful to you down the road, then you might want to sell yourself in for a little bit longer. But if it's more of the same and you could go somewhere else and do the same or do something better, then, you know, you just don't, you don't carry it on your resume. You just, it was just a moment that you tried and you move on. If you make it, if you make it two years, organizations will, 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 you know, be thinking about that as a success. I think that's kind of that, that mark of 18 months or less is something that an organization would normally say, well, this, this has, this hasn't worked out. Okay. For individuals, sometimes things don't work out. And as Marie said, maybe, maybe it's, it's saying, um, you know, you don't even include it in a resume. Um, you know, if, if, it, if, it, if it's something that happens that quickly. Uh, life is too short to put yourself through a lot of misery though. And particularly if, if um, what you're seeing is long-term, this, this thing isn't gonna work. And I think if it is the case where you do keep it on your resume, just to state the obvious, you know, the big thing there is, well, what lessons did you learn from there? But answering the question without insulting that company or its leadership. Right. And anything further on that? Well, I'll, I'll take that. We'll, we'll end with that one. And uh, I would just like to say, Steve, thank you very much. I mean, from beginning to end, that was wonderful with great tidbits all throughout. And um, I put Steve's LinkedIn profile in the chat. So feel free to connect to him. And uh, next week, we've got somebody, um, we've got Juliana Stone coming to us from Denver, who's going to talk with us on um, interview, um, interview strategies and tactics for the C-suite. So hope, hopefully you'll join us next week. We'll get some information out on that. And then a recording of this. Thank you very much, Steve. We'll be posted to the Mighty Network so you can go back and take a look at it. And um, like I said, connect up to Steve and very, very grateful for you joining us today, Steve, and sharing that with us. My pleasure. Thank you all. Thanks, everybody, for joining today. We'll see you next week. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day. Thanks. Bye-bye.